everyone. Welcome to another Speed Secrets podcast. Today's guest is driver, coach, and friend, Jim Kearney. Jim, uh, welcome back to the show because just before this, I actually went back and I looked and we had, we recorded a podcast back on back in August of 2019, so a year yeah. and a half ish ago, uh, episode 139. Um, and you know we had we had some fun talking about driving and all sorts of things. But uh, I, I, today I want us to focus on driver coaching and how we can help drivers be better drivers. And I and I was thinking about it going your your coaching record. You got a pretty amazing coaching record, especially at the oh, SCCA right. runoffs. I mean, how many how many SCCA champions, runoff champions, have you coached? Well, there's uh, in eleven years I've had sixteen on the podium, and six of them have been gold. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a bad record. Just just at the SEC runoffs, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so you know, based on that, and you know, I've had a little bit of ex- a little bit of success as a coach. You kind of got to go. Why doesn't every single driver have a coach? And I know somebody's immediately going because it costs money. Uh, but but somehow they find money to get to the track, to spend money on tires, to spend money on their car, to spend money on. And so uh, just kind of throw it out there. Your thoughts on the why does every driver not have a coach? Well, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff I do is with club racers. That's what I did, club racing. And um, it's not initially in their budget. And if it's not initially in their budget, then they're thinking about that as a last minute add on. And uh, the nature of racing and motorsports is such that there's always something coming up with the, the motor. There's always come something coming up with the tow vehicle. There's, you know, there's a rising um, crisis uh, approaching every race. It seems where, you know, something is gobbling up that racing budget you know so i you know i understand it completely uh, i just think that um it's a it's something that until you get to a certain point of um sophistication and how you're looking at your racing budget you kind of think like well you know that's a you know most like a treat i'll give myself someday and both of us both of us you and i and many others have come from that you know, we've got, we have no budget. Uh, um, that doesn't mean we have an unlimited budget. We have no budget, literally. And, uh, you know, we're trying to go racing on next to nothing. And, and you're right. I think coaching is kind of thought of as that, like you said, an add on or a treat or an extra. And mm-hmm. I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, there was probably a time when people thought, well, tuning your, your shock absorbers, your dampers is an extra. And now, sure. you know, to win, that's kind of a, you got to be there. And at one time, I think, yeah, I mean, there was probably a time where it's like the number of tires you had, they were extras. Well, now there's a, it, it's become a, a must have. And I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, and, you know, this is not a me looking for a job because don't worry, I have enough coaching work as it is. Uh, but I wonder when it's going to become a, not an extra, not a treat, not an add-on. Yeah, I don't know if really if it ever will. Um, it's just one of those things. Um, you know, I tell people sometimes if, you know, and I say it very lightly because, again, the money thing is always going to be um, a hot button for, for everybody. But I will point out that, you know, everything else wears out. But if you're learning stuff and you come up with a process that really seems to fit you, you can keep that. I mean, it doesn't wear out. I mean, I think it's nice to have a a coach every time you go out, but you don't necessarily have to have that. If you learn something about yourself or you come up with a good process that works for you and you can see results, you get to keep that. I wonder how many professional sports teams look at coaching as an extra Uh, um, or you know, if you're a parent and your daughter or your son is playing soccer or baseball or hockey or something like that, if 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 it was like, okay, you can sign, sign your son or daughter up for this soccer team or this football team, but we're not going to have any coaches. 
Right. <laughs> like, it's funny, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, well, the other thing I think that um, plays into it is that, and a lot of stuff in life uh, isn't logic. We know that. I think people think in terms of, you know, am I uh, good enough to be able to benefit from a coach? And other people will ask uh, if I'm working with somebody like uh, I'm working with uh, Scott Rebenzer for the last two years. He's a two time national champion and he won the FRP masters in uh, formula 1600 the last two years and people will say like well why does he need a coach and it's a different way of obviously scott looks at it you know differently so if you ask the question it's almost like they're saying are you too good to need a coach or not good enough and neither of those really makes sense in my opinion i think that it's a matter of whether you um number one can can fit it into your motorsports budget. Uh, and the other is, I think you have to have a, a sense of, yeah, I'm, I'm going to set my ego aside. I don't, I'm not fearful of somebody kind of looking at me close up. Um, and I think that that can be something that uh, some people are just really uncomfortable with. They just, they don't understand um, the process. So I'm not, you know, I'm sure you're not telling them how to drive. They know how to drive. The question is, can you coach them to have them present themselves to the track a little bit better? And oftentimes you can. Uh, and if they get a little bit better, they get a little bit better after that. And then you've got this staircase that they're climbing and uh, it doesn't need to be, in my mind, in, in any way intrusive. I tell them you know, I'm your ally, I'm not your critic. Um, I think it's really important that they have a sense that whatever is said between us stays between us. Um, I never talk about, you know, my uh, clients unless they give me a specific, you know, authorization to do so. And that sense that it's almost like a confessional where they can come in after a session and um, as they're, I want them to do the track map, I tell them that's my only big rule and uh i want them to do that before they speak to anybody um and sometimes as they're trying to figure out what they think the car was doing or what they were doing in a particular series of terms they may not be able to um you know express it clearly because they don't necessarily understand it and uh, that i think is an acceptable answer and then we'll work on that over the course of, of the day and I think that that's actually can be a really big breakthrough where a driver realizes like, oh, well, okay, I don't have to be like uh, Art and Senna and have a five hour debrief. I can spit out a few things and maybe they're helpful. And uh, a lot of times it's not so much what the driver is writing down on the track map that is determinative. It's the beginning, that's a beginning for a conversation. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of, at least a lot of folks that I have worked with have said that other people have come up to them uh, after I have left or gone to work with somebody else that same race. Uh, we'll say, so what does he actually do? <laughs> and uh, I remember one guy, um, an Indian guy, Guy Bellingham said, uh, well, it's kind of like this. Uh, Jim comes over and you have a talk and uh, he tells you a bunch of stuff that you already know and you go out and drive fast. <laughs> good answer that was hilarious yeah yeah well and i want to go back to the you know your comment about some drivers thinking they're not ready for a coach yet and uh you know i part of that depends on how you define coach too right you know if somebody's their first day at the track do they need do they need a coach like you um Oh, uh, so I think, you know, part of it depends on that definition of what is a coach and, but, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious, ha have you had a driver who, you know, an ex can you give me an example of that where, where a driver was like, you know, Hey, I don't think I'm ready for a coach yet. And yet you ended up working with them and they went, Whoa, I guess I was. Yeah. I think that, uh, there was a fellow who was, um, 
Um, again, you know, a lot of the uh, drivers I've worked with originally were in Formula B because that's the class that I raced in. Originally, that was the, you know, uh, place where a lot of my customers came from. And one fellow was reluctant about using a coach. And I think that turned out to be one of those situations where he kind of thought like, whoa, if Jim is here comparing me to these other top drivers, I'm going to look bad. Uh, you know, and, uh, and I'm kind of thinking like, well, <laughs> you know, you're already on the track with them. You know, at the end of every session, there's a sheet that's, you know, put out on the net that comes up and everybody knows where they rank. You know, you're just, it, there's that one thing at a racetrack is there's not an easy place to hide. Yeah. But if you're, he was thinking in terms of I'm pretty comfortable being in the mid teens of like a 22, 24 car pack. And that's kind of like where he was living, so to speak. And he was comfortable there, yeah. not yeah. really satisfied, but comfortable. And uh, as we, the first thing I remember with him was at um, Summit Point, there's a really fast turn that's determinative and really quick um kind of like you know in the old days you'd say separates the men from the boys you don't say that anymore but you know what i mean and he was really stunned to see how close he was segment time wise to the top cars he almost couldn't believe it and it turned out his deficiencies were other places right and right. they were you know initially you know somewhat significant so maybe he'd be two and a half seconds off on a two mile track and that would get him into that middle of the you know the teens maybe grid 14th or 16th or something like that but at turn 10 this heroically difficult intimidating turn he was maybe you know two tenths off and he just you know obviously there's work there but he just kind of couldn't believe that and that was i think the eye-opening thing for him that if we could take a specific turn uh, that we, you know, would identify as something that he needed to work on, that he could actually take very specific concrete steps and see his segment times get better. And it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And it's like probably a stockbroker working with a beginning investor and the beginning investor starts to see some cash pile up in their account and they kind of think gee whiz you know maybe there's more <laughs> that's that's the nature of competitive people and um, but until they see it happening some people are just kind of slogging away repeating what they're doing so i'm not saying when i said he was comfortable in the mid-teens i don't mean he was happy or satisfied but that was like a uh, almost like a comfort zone. And as he was extending himself outside of the comfort zone, if he felt he could do that in a very specific, safe fashion, he was game for that. And he was particularly game for it when the segment time started to become competitive. So, you know, he was at, at a summit point, a really fast lap in a Formula B was in the one high 124s, the low 125s, and he was in somewhere in the 27s, mid 27s. And by the end of, uh, you know, a year or two, and I didn't go with him to every race, but he did run in the high 24, and he did run in the top three of a national pack with, um, you know, a majors race with multiple national champions there. And, uh, that was really um energizing to him and uh you know it was you know that's great fun to me that's from the coaching standpoint that's really as good as it gets it's wonderful don't get me wrong to be working with people that win championships you know or are on the runoffs podium I mean, that's you know great joy but to see somebody who thought they couldn't do it realize that they can actually methodically get better that to me is a really um you know that's about as good as it gets i think well uh you know one of the things i'm i'm, I'm hoping that so not 
uh, as much as I would like it, not everybody listening to this is going to go out and get a coach tomorrow. Uh, but I'm hoping that some of the things we talk about is going to trigger some things where they can think about, well, how can I coach myself in the same way? And I think, you know, something that we've we've talked about, you've talked a lot, a lot about is, is, you know, part of a coach's job is to help identify, prioritize. In the case of the fellow at Summit Point, that driver was thinking, well, I need to be really, I need to be better in that really fast corner. But you come along, you start to look at it, things, maybe stepping back and being able to look at it and go, that's actually not the place that you need to focus on. You need to focus here, here, and here. So I think prioritizing what to work on that's going to make the, have the biggest impact. And I think, you know, that is something that a driver can do, even if you don't have a coach, but sometimes it's easy to get caught up in that, well, I must not be as good as the best drivers in that fast corner. Um, and then just get sucked into focusing on that when that isn't really the big place. Right. So, yeah. More importantly, he felt he wasn't as good as the other fast drivers everywhere. Well, and, and that the other, that, that's the other thing that triggers this. And I've, I've told this story before of, you know, you were talking about somebody not happy, not satisfied being in the middle, but comfortable. Like that's their comfort zone. And I've done this, this, uh, process, you know, I've had drivers and I say, just close your eyes and imagine you're on the grid and you're on the pace lap and you're coming towards the green flag. Now, where are you? And they go, I'm 12th. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you not first? And, and so I think, right. you know, what, what that's doing is that's the person's comfort zone. That's where they think they, that's where they believe deep down inside they belong. And you know, that whole thing of if you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right, right? It, it's right. <laughs> it, it's w what what comes first, the belief that I should be running high 24s or low 25s and running the top three, or I'm just, this is where I belong because this is where I'm at. And I would actually say, I, I don't want to give away all of our secrets here, but uh, uh, Jim, I think one of the things that coaches sometimes do is they simply give a driver confidence or belief or a reason to believe I'm no longer 12th. I can run third now because I've got Jim working with me. And that gives it it's, you know, I can come along and say, well, just believe you're a, you're going to win the race. Eh, that doesn't exactly work. Right. It doesn't work. But, but if I say that, that usually comes to tears. Yeah. If I say, okay, we're going to work on this process and we're going to work on this and this and this and this, and you're going to get more education and more knowledge here and more experience and this and this. And because of that, you should be running the top three. All of a sudden, now there's a reason for the brain to go, I should be in the top three. And then there's something super powerful in that I belong in the top three. Does that make sense? Yeah, to well, you? you know what I would, I would suggest in that scenario that we not talk about with this theoretical or person, the top three, because that'll freak him out. Yeah. But if we, if we work on his car, his drive, and get that car going a little bit better, he understands why. Yeah. And then owns that gain. And maybe that gets him to 12th. Yeah. And then, then maybe he's 10th. And that's to me is the way that, uh, it's going to work out because, you know, um, in this case, uh, the fellow made gains uh, very methodically. It was really uh, interesting. And as a coach, you know, you don't know how far somebody can take something. You really don't know until they do it. You know, right. And, um, uh, and I was just just stop watching it. this. How, how many times have you been asked? How many times have you been asked, you know, can, can I run at the front of the pack? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's the only legitimate answer, really, you know, because because um, it's really a, a difficult thing in most of these in many of these classes. It's really, really um, difficult. And um, until people do it, you really don't know. And as they're making progress, you also don't know at some point where they're going to kind of, you know, max out at least temporarily. There'd be a plateau. This guy had a plateau around seven uh, and uh, 
one time he said to me, it got, um, I got up to sevens and it got all stupid out there. <laughs> and I kind of, you know, that's kind of what happens and you're fighting in the top six or seven in the last three or four laps, you know, and he just wasn't ready for, for that. It was kind of like uh, the dog chasing the, the car and he gets there, he doesn't know what to do. And that's what this guy's situation was. And I told him, there's nothing wrong with this. This is new ground for you. You know, you know, yeah. you're not competing with the guys who were 16. You're competing, you know, you've reached um, the front of the field when drivers are better, more aggressive, and it's going to be more difficult. But gradually he dealt with that. It just, um, you have to let them, I think, well, I think you may have said this in one of your, you know, a plateau is kind of like a, a launching point you just but you don't know when it's going to launch you know so you just have to be methodical about it and be willing to um learn to live with it not accept it but learn to live with it and eventually it won't seem quite as all that stupid out there and you'll start to work your way through that so even if you cannot or will not or whatever uh have a coach tomorrow you know, a couple of things here I, I, that I'm hearing you you say is just this. Sometimes you got to have a little bit of patience, which which is not a, not something that people who drive around racetracks quickly are known for as having good lots of patience. But there is a point where, again, not not being happy about being on a plateau, but having a little patience, going that is going to be another launching point, stepping point, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's focusing in on what's the priorities. And then, as you pointed out, it is, is knowing that when you have this process, there's a reason why you should be getting better. Because I think, personally, I think what holds a lot of people back is they've developed skills, but they're stuck in that comfort zone. And they don't believe that they should be able to move forward. And I think once you start to realize that you work through these process, there is no reason why you shouldn't be improving. And if that improvement takes you from 12th to 11th or 12th to 7th or to 3rd or whatever it is, that is that is what it is. So I, I, that's kind of what I'm hearing you saying. I'm just throwing it back yeah, so the, the listeners hardest, can get it. I think the hardest part of the person trying to coach themselves is that it's really difficult to look at yourself. Yeah. It's just hard I mean, in any way, shape, or form, whether you're in the race car, at a racetrack, or at work, or at home. It's really difficult to fairly, you know, assess yourself. I mean, how can you be objective about yourself? And so they, I think one of the things uh, a coach can do is just kind of be there with you and observe. And so it may be that, you know, you're, you know, there's 10 minutes to go and, uh, they're frantically trying to get the car ready, you know, and I'm thinking like, this isn't, this isn't good. I mean, you never tuned into an Olympic broadcast to see Mike, Michael Phelps uh, swim a Olympic event. And he's running around looking for a swimsuit. That doesn't happen. You know, these guys have a system in place. They have a system in place. Now in the, um, you know, a convivial environment that is a lot of SCCA racing. There's a lot of interaction and I understand that, but that doesn't mean that you can't figure out a way to impose uh, a system that you you are applying. And it doesn't need to be, you know, um, any kind of, you know, super, super serious, complicated thing. It's just being aware of time and being ready early, I think, and yeah, that does mean that you have nothing to do for a while. Maybe that'll initially make you nervous, but that at least allows you to think about, well, what am I doing? It's not all about the car. Like Lance Armstrong wrote the book, it's not about the bike, um, regardless of what you think of Lance. I mean, I think what applies to a lot of motorsports is it's not all about the car. The car is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. The motor, the tires, the shot, everything. But the person who gets in the car has a dramatic effect on it. And a lot of times, and you know, we're the uh, club racer, not to pick on anybody, but he'll adjust and inspect and measure 
everything within a you know a nanosecond. Uh, measure tires, tire pressure, everything, temps, just everything is analysis. And then at the last minute, they jump in the car and they think to themselves, if they do that, I hope I'm in the best mood. It, you know, it's just, you would never think like, uh, we'll check the oil, you know, at the mid middle of the season. You'd never think like, uh, maybe there's the right amount of, uh, you know, air in the tires or, you know, the shocks are at the right setting. And you, you analyze that stuff. And so they need to, I think, take some time to fairly look at themselves. And to me, it's obvious that um, having some sort of a system is um, better than having it just kind of left to chance. So the coach's job sometimes yeah. is to help uh, create or fine tune or even just trigger that system or process, right? You know, sometimes. Yes. You know, a couple of, you know, I like to keep everything light, you know, there's, there's no, there's no benefit from bringing a sense of a burden to the, to the thing. It's hard enough already. My God, you know, the club racer is, you know, taking care of his job. He's loaded the car. He's built the car. He's got, you know, this just goes on and on. So the idea of making it more burdensome is not the way to go at all. But simple questions can really help. You know, we ask them, like, how much time to go? Like, oh, we got, oh, we have, you know, 25 minutes. I thought we had an hour and 25 minutes. Well, that's a different situation. And a lot of times people will pick up on that. And a lot of times afterwards, you know, in the discussion afterwards, you, you can say, you know, it just seemed like, things were rushed as we got ready. Whenever I'm rushed, I didn't feel as comfortable or as confident as when I thought like, man, I got this. Yeah. You know, it's not a matter of I'm going to go out and dominate, but I've taken care of my job here with this car. I'm not sitting there thinking like, are the brakes the way I want them? Did we remember to put in fuel? You know, do we check the oil? You know, there's an endless list. And if you're thinking those questions to yourself when you're on the grid or on your way to the grid, you're just coming up with, you know, uh, a list of things that might go wrong. And that's the opposite of, that's confusion. And to me, confusion is like kryptonite to confidence. You just have this worry. And that's not the feeling you want when a driver goes on track. Well, and you you use the the word mood, and I talk about state of mind, and I think th- that I, I I I've got stories and examples of how helping somebody just get into the right state of mind or mood prior to performing takes their performance to a whole other level that they never expected, and I, I'm curious, you know, do you have an example? Do you have a story of that where where just by changing the driver's mood, the, it upped their game that day. Yeah, I was um, maybe four or five years ago at Watkins Glen. I was working with a Formula V driver by the name of Jonathan Wyside. Great guy. Been on the runoffs podium himself. Track record holder type guy. Um, but it was torrential downpour. I mean, it was in Watkins Glen, it rains a lot. That's no surprise. This is a torrential downpour. It was so much uh, rain that they actually put the schedule on hold around lunchtime. And they thought that um, there's a good chance that they were going to cancel the event. The track was flooded in a number of places. And um, people kept stopping by Jonathan's um, pit area. He was gridded on the front row. Um, of course, that was in the dry. And uh, the day before, kind of saying, you know, are you going to win? Are you going to win? And I could see him getting tighter and tighter. It was like watching somebody crank down on a violin string. And finally, um, even though it was raining like hell, I got an umbrella and got one for him. And I said, let's go for a walk. Because I wanted him to get out of that specific environment. And uh, as we walked along, um, he wasn't saying anything. And I said, well, you know, John, when you think about it, you're in complete control. here." And his head kind of snapped off his shoulders and looked at me like, what are you talking about? 
And I said, well, you know, you've put a lot of time and money and effort into this car. He built his own car. He had a great Auto Works motor. Uh, he had uh, Ray Carmody, a great Formula V guy there, helping him with the car. He had a really good team in place. Uh, but he looked like uh, like he was, uh, you know, a cow going down a cattle chute, and he knew what was going to happen at the end of the cattle chute. You know? He was just super grim. And I said, you know, you can just decide that this isn't worth it, that on this particular day, you know, you just decided that uh, you don't want to go out. You don't want to run this race. And it was a revelation to him. You know, he just said something like, that's right. It's, you know, it's my effort. It's my effort. So I said, yeah, and they're we're wonderful and they're deep. And, uh, you know, I applaud them. But, um, you know, if you want, one of the things that you might do is you might run the first lap and just see if it gets really crazy. You can just drive right in. There's no harm in just driving right in. We're not putting you know, money on the table here. You're still going to have a house. You're still going to have a family. You know, this is a this is a very sophisticated kind of you know extreme hobby, but it's a hobby, and you can just decide that you don't want to do it. And he thought a lot about that, and uh, he decided that he would start the race and see how it went. He wasn't very comfortable in the rain, so we did a rain discussion. You know, uh, and he got into turn one first and again you know cars will break really nicely in a straight line in the wet they'll accelerate out they just don't like to turn so yeah. he had a discussion he did a nice rain line out of one and he won the race by eight seconds he was never headed and i'm you know that might have happened anyway that might have happened anyway but i don't think so i think that um well you know as you know a big deal in the rain is you've got to be calm. You've got to have smoothness. You know, you can't be jerky jerking the car around. And uh, I think that in the frame of mind he was in before that, it wouldn't have uh, gone as well. Well, it's interesting. so there are so many things there. The fact that you took the pressure off by kind of saying, you know, this isn't, <laughs> we're not curing cancer here. Um, right. You know, you're going to have a job, you're going to have a family, you're going to have a home, you know, afterwards, anyways, no matter what you do. Uh, you know, so you took the pressure away. You um, you spent some time giving him or at least refreshing knowledge around the rain line and how to drive in the rain. So that automatically kind of gives you a little bit more confidence. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm prepared for this. Right. And of course, starting the poll, you get to turn one, you're in the lead. You're the one car without a big spray in front of you. <laughs> so that does give you a little more confidence. And then it kind of builds from there. Right. Um, yeah. And as you were saying that uh, I, I recall a race, it was an IMSA race at Watkins Glen uh, way back when. And uh, it was one of those same kind of just pouring rain and it was raining all day. And, you know, with an IMSA race, all the teams of the big transporters with the awnings out and I'm standing there under the awning next to my car and I'm kind of looking around and I'm looking down the, down the paddock area at the other teams and I can see other drivers and they're all standing there kind of hunched over a little bit, looking up at the sky going, ah, I wish this rain would go away. And at that moment in time, I went out and I, no umbrella, no hat, no nothing. I started walking up and down the paddock area, just kind of like, ah, I love a day like today. <laughs> and, and, and I love the rain. And I could see everybody else, all the other drivers kind of looking at me like, you're a whack job, right? <laughs> this but, dude's crazy. But I just went, I'm just going to enjoy this. I'm going to have fun. And I went out and wailed on people in the rain. And of course, then it builds your confidence. And then you start to believe that you're some kind of rain god, you know. And, and so it just builds on itself. And that's the that's the fun part, I think, of, of well, managing that state of mind, that mood, that whole kind of thing. And uh, um, yeah, it's really cool the way you took the pressure off him, then built his confidence in a way that's not a rah-rah, you can do this, <laughs> but you yeah, I think the, the big key is that um, he came from a mindset where, you know, all you guys are going to die. <laughs> he, you know, those who want to participate can participate. And a lot of times I think the big difference is that whether it's regardless of 
you're deciding to go out and run an event like that, or if you're kind of concerned about you're not, your lap times are not what you'd like them to be. Uh, if you focus on yourself and the choices that you're making, it's so much more empowering than thinking, yeah, but this other car is faster than mine. And this other driver is somehow, I don't know how he's a second and a half faster than me. I mean, you know, that's almost irrelevant to you and your car. Get in you, your car and drive it a little bit better. And if they think it's their choice, which it ultimately always is, but if they're coming from that standpoint, they're much more likely, I think, to perform um, in a reasonable way and not feel like somebody's got a gun to their head. And a lot of times it's themselves who, who are kind of thinking like, God, I have to do this. I have to do this. Yeah. I'm scared to do it. I don't want to talk that way. I don't want to think that way, but I've got to force myself to do it. But if you think about their here having a, they're at a wonderful uh, venue. Um, it's kind of an interesting challenge. And, you know, they go out and apply some of the skills that they're learning uh, and things that they're thinking about themselves and learning about themselves, actually, that that's more fun. And as they're having more fun, they're likely to perform better, which is more fun by itself. And that, I think, this is, uh, to me, the big key. It sets the foundation for them doing better. I don't want them thinking like, you know, yeah, I can get through the last turn at Watkins Glen flat out maybe once in 100 times and 99 times I'm going to smear myself against the wall. I want them to see a reasonable way that they can methodically do that a little bit better. And that's not as terrifying. Yeah, it's still yeah. that turn in particular is a terrifying turn. It doesn't have to be life or death. Well, and, and, and so going back to kind of what the coach does, I mean, sometimes the coach turns that spiral that's spiraling down sure. and turns it around and spirals it up. And because everything you've talked about is it's about building and it, and it keeps building and spiraling up rather than going the other way. Um, and the other thing, you know, we touched on is just you know, vision and knowing where you're going and all that kind of stuff, which builds confidence and everything else. And we were talking just briefly before we got started here about uh, kind of the visual references and the pictures that we use when we're going around a track. And um, you had talked about the, you know, different frame rates of, of how we see things. And I use this, uh, this term, you know, mental vision, you know, when you come up to a corner you have a picture of it or you should have a picture of it in your mind before you get there. And you and I both use have our drivers visualize, but it's one thing to be sitting in your comfy chair at home with your eyes closed, visualizing driving the track. It's another to be coming up to that last turn at Watkins Glen, for example, at speed with the car on the ragged edge coming through turn 10 and, but already having a mental picture of where am I coming out of turn 11 onto the front straight? And uh, so I'm just, I'm, uh, tell me, tell me how you talk about that. I, like, I'm curious to hear how you explain that, that process. Well, it's great if you can do a track walk, an actual physical track walk, but it's hard to do these days. I mean, people are busy and sometimes the tracks won't let you out there, but if you've got a nice uh, version of either your um, virtual track walk, you know, you can print that out. I think that's okay. And uh, sometimes I'll walk around the track and take pictures every, I don't know, 30 yards or so, hold the camera down by my knee. So I'm looking at, you know, giving the driver a view that he's going to see from the car. And I think that, yeah, everybody's got, not everybody, but most people have an in-car camera that they can look at that video. There's YouTubes out the yin-yang, people go and look at that. But to me, looking at stills for some reason is different. So if I give them a, a photo book, and we go through it page by page, and every time you turn the page, there's nothing moving. They just sit there and look at it. And I say, you can, you know, here's a possible reference point, and here's a possible reference point. And you're not gonna see all this, but you know, pick out something that you like, and now, okay, turn the page, and now we're another, let's say, 20 yards down the road. This is what it's going to look like. 
and look at that as long as you want. And then I ideally, I think, is that uh, they had the photo book with them all the time. And sometimes I'll say flip through it, you know, uh, 40 minutes before you go out and stop if there's something that kind of, if you have a sense like I should stop and look at this picture a little bit more, stop and look at that picture a little bit more because there's something not yet totally assembled in your memory bank. And that's not at all unusual. It's not at all unusual. And for debriefs, after you've done the track map or a debrief sheet, I think um, in discussing that, say, last turn at Watkins Glen, the usual, the big horror is I can't get back over to the left. And when I get back over to the left, I fear that it's happening so quickly that I'm going at slightly the wrong angle. And God forbid, I can't pick up my turn in point. But if you have them look at those photos over and over again, and then at the end of the day, um, you know, just flip through them before you go to sleep. Take them back with you to your hotel. Just flick through them. And I don't think you need to actually ask specific analytical questions in that situation. I think you know, you're tired. Uh, your, your brain needs a break. You need to go to sleep. But your brain is going to be working on that all night long. All you need to do is show it the pictures and it'll say at some level, we need to help them there. And in the morning, you know, you won't be aware of it, but as you drive the car, oftentimes it's better. It's, you know, it's smoother. It's more together. And uh, it's, you know, it's less of that kind of heart in your throat kind of thing, thinking, oh, my God. Yeah. So there, there, is, there is something about, and this is something I've spent a ton of time on more recently, especially with uh, the use of simulators. And, uh, you know, and I just wrote an article about this, about, you know, well, if I can get on my simulator and just drive a track, how is that any better than closing my eyes and visualizing the track? And I think you found something that, that I've found as well is when the mind has to fill in the gaps, it works a little harder. And when it's worked a little harder, it's now been programmed deeper into your brain. If I just show you a video and you just watch the video, it's almost like your mind goes, yeah, I'll just sit back and watch. Like it's not, it's not actively engaged. It's not working right. at it. And therefore it doesn't really become programmed or part of, you know, deep down in, in your brain. And so I think I love the idea of the, or I love using the, you know, the stills, because the brain has to fill in those gaps. And when it does, it's solid. It makes a huge difference. I'll tell you a quick funny story. I worked with um, a really terrific Formula V driver by the name of Roger Siebenauer, maybe one of the best ever. And a set of circumstances had a, um, you know, affected him before the 2019 runoffs of PIR, where he just didn't have any time at all. Work was a problem, his parents were ill, and uh, he said to me at one point, you know, I've never been less prepared for a race in my life. And that got my attention. And uh, one of my other uh, clients had to withdraw because of a home emergency. And I thought, like, I'm just going to see what I can do to help Roger out. And I had said, you know, get out there and see the turns. He had never been to VIR. He had never been to VIR. He had never looked at a simulator. He's an old school guy. And I'm not making this up. I'm down at oak tree turn 12 in the stands and he and his uh, engine builder dave carr kind of climb up into the stands with me and i'm glad that at least they're getting out to see the track and the only map he had <laughs> the only map he had was that little thing that they give you when you enter the event that kind of tells you where the concession stands are uh -huh. <laughs> it was pitiful and uh, so i said to him and, and i had a break between sessions and i kind of said a couple of things to him. I said, you want to lay off that apex in turn 11 so you can line up nicely for turn 12, the classic oak tree. And he turned to me and he said, you mean there's two turns down here? Think about that. Wow. Think about it. So we did the visual stuff over and over again. And you could see him, you just see him filling it in. You could just see him filling it in. And he did one test day. Uh, the first qualifying session, he was 15th out of 26 or 28 cars. 
in the second session, he was third. And he led the race. He actually had a suspension failure. And he's a terrific driver, like I say. Um, but I, you could see him filling it in, in particular going up to turn 11. It's, you know, essentially it's totally blind. You've gone through turn 10, lickety split. You're plunging downhill. You're going faster and faster. And now you're going uphill, but you can't see really where you're going. And your eye picks up the beginning of the apex curve for turn 11. And it says, well, at least that's something. Let's go over there. Yeah. And the hands start to come across. And you're thinking, no, no, no. And you have to you know, show people those, those different visuals. And they can, I think, plug them in a frame at a time and gradually put it into the place so that as they're going up there blind, they realize, yeah, I need to be wide of that. That allows me to have a nice run into Oak Tree Turn 12 and a methodical, predictable exit out. Well, I love the, I, the, the that whole concept of you got to fill in the blanks, essentially. And, and again, when you fill in the blanks, it's a whole lot better than if I filled them in for you. Right. you know, it's, it's like, you know, if, if I give you... Uh, you know, a math test, you know, I, I have grade three math test uh, arithmetic and, and, you know, there's the blanks of, you know, two plus what equals four. If, if you figure that out and put two in there, it's going to stick with you a whole lot longer than if I've written two plus two equals four, read that a 12 times. It's just, right. it's, it, it's, it's, you figured it out. And I think that's, that's a big piece. And I think, you know, I hate to say it, but you know, as drivers, we're kind of lazy people. You know, <laughs> um, so we want it, we want the easiest way to get the solution. And yet, sometimes when you do the work of filling in the blanks, it sticks with you a little longer. So, um, Jim, last thing, and then I'll uh, let you go, and we'll get back to preparing for our next coaching gigs, which I know we're both doing. Um, what's your one piece of advice that you want to give? What's your one speed secrets for this show? You're a speed secret. Simplify. 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 Yeah. The cars are incredibly complex. Everything about the cars are incredibly complex. And a lot of times what people end up talking about is the complexity of the exhaust system or the shocks and everything. is. And it is. I mean, engineers dealing with that stuff, they're in a different world. But a guy who's about to get in the car and drive uh, kind of a, a try to find a fast line to me is kind of like a tightrope walker and all he needs to know is there's the line and I want to be calm and I want to stay on it I don't want to go too far to the right I don't want to go too far to the left I'll fall off the Tim tightrope yeah. it's yeah. So the driver going out you know has to have I think a maximum of three things in mind I like to give them a whiteboard, say, I say, write three things on it that you want to do, your words, and have the board be where you're getting dressed. So you look at that damn board about those three things that you've decided in your words that you want to focus upon. And I think one of the benefits of that is the other 37 things that maybe their, you know, their brain is kind of saying, what about me? We should be taking care of this. We should be dealing with this. You know, it just says, I've got the damn whiteboard. I'm doing these three things. And it's a way to focus the brain to just kind of say, you know, we got this. Yeah, we're not perfect. Yeah, we're not, you know, Rick Mears. We're not Art and Senna. We're, you know, Joe Blow, but we're getting better. And we've got a plan here. That plan, I think, is a really big deal. And if you look at it and when you get back in, you kind of say, here's what we accomplished and now we're going to do kind of like rinse and repeat and go out again with another plan but we're getting a little bit better to me that's the most likely approach to have the driver stay centered and um, calm so simplify applies to car prep car tuning but especially to driver tuning especially yeah especially yeah Great, great, great stuff. Great stuff. Jim, uh, how do listeners uh, get hold of you, follow you, learn more about what uh, you're coaching and what you're doing? Uh, if you Google Corny Driver Development, it's spelled the Irish way, 
K-E-A-R-N-E-Y, driver development. Um, that's the best way. Uh, yeah, the website is www.carneykdd.com. As in Carney Driver Development. Cool. You got it. <laughs> Well, and, and I'll put a link in the show notes so people can connect with you. And, uh, you know, if somebody wants to win the SCCA runoffs, I know who I'd be calling right now. Uh, you're going to be busy. <laughs> yeah. We're going to Indy this year, Ross. Yeah, yeah, back to Indy. That's cool. And yeah. uh, uh, a special facility in many ways, right? You know, and in... Uh, I'm not going to get into the argument as to whether it's a more exciting, better racetrack than VIR or Laguna Seca or whatever, but it is Indy. That's a pretty special place. So good luck there. I, I agree. I, I think it's not, you know, the greatest uh, road course in the world, but it is Indy and it's got a special challenge to it. And uh, because it's Indy, you got to step up and figure out the way to, to maximize it. Yeah. Well, Jim, good luck there. Good luck all season. Uh, And most importantly, keep helping your drivers learn and have fun as well. Thanks. Thank you, Ross, for the opportunity. And thanks for all you do for drivers. You've you've really done a great job with um, helping people think inward. That's what it's all about, I think. It is. (laughs) Thanks. If you like this episode, then do yourself and Ross a big favor. Subscribe to the Speed Secrets podcast. You'll hear from experts on driving, engineering, brain function, and much, much more. Then share it with a friend or two, or three, or leave a comment, or suggest a guest. And be sure to come back for more interesting podcasts. As Ross always says, keep learning and having fun.